So um, we're going to start doing our first modeling now. So follow along if you're like completely lost and you know it's like a waste of my time to keep going and you look around and the person next to you also gives you the same look that you're giving them, let me know. Um, I don't say that to intimidate you. It's just that sometimes this stuff can be pretty dense um, and it's really hard to understand the first time around. So I might have to explain it in a different way. Okay, but um, I think I gave you a pretty good primer as to, you know, what we're up against here, inception and all that. So um, let's kind of get started, right? So you understand the premise of setting a base point. Um, let's take a look at what that actually means. So, uh, well, actually, let's first start with the user interface and some of the hotkeys. So um, I'll introduce a few of the shortcuts to do cool things, uh, do complex things in very cool and easy ways. Um, as we you know, progress, I don't want to give you everything at once. That wouldn't be any fun. Um, so to start off, the, probably the simplest hotkey and you know, one of the most beneficial things that you could do is you know, figure out how to search for commands if you have no idea what it is you're looking for. And so if you double click in the workspace, it says enter a search keyword. Okay, so that's going to be a way that you can begin to search for different uh, nodes or commands um, directly in a directly relatable way to the way that you would do it in Rhino, right? So in Rhino at the top, you can start typing in a command and it shows a little list of similar commands. So like when I was going to do a sphere, I could actually just type in SPH and there's sphere. But there's also a couple of other different types of spheres and ways of manipulating sphere in there. Um, that show up as well. Very similar to Rhino. Um, so that would have been a way that I can go ahead and drop in the sphere. Um, additionally, like I said, the number slider is going to be very, very important to you. Um, so you can also double click in the space and create a number slider very simply by typing in the uh, less than, less than relationship that you're looking for in your number slider. So rather than dropping in the generic one, double clicking into it, and then changing all the values, you can say that I want a number slider that goes from 0 to, say, 100, but I need to give it a starting point. So I'll say 50 is less than 100. So 0 less than 50 less than 100, and hit Enter, and it creates a slider with those properties. Yes? Does, that, does it have to be a midpoint that you put in? You need something to go in there. Okay. So you could start at zero too. You could say zero is less than. Actually, I don't know. Let's try that. Oh. I've never tried to do zero is less than zero. Yeah, that works too. Okay. That middle one just says where do I want to start, okay. and then you can then slide it around. <clears throat> um, so user interface wise. The, you know, obviously the overall program has its typical file, edit, view, display, all that stuff. You know, there, you can explore those at your own discretion, but, you know, there's not too much different about those than what we would experience in many other programs, except for maybe display and solution. Uh, solution has to do with, like, uh, time and physics dependent um, components. So if we drop in a component that actually functions off of time, you can have it kind of, you know, save the state or stop and play and pause and all this other stuff. So um, display is kind of more about how are you visualizing everything either in Rhino or in Grasshopper. Okay, so that that's pretty simple and self-explanatory. But the, the most important thing here to, to get is that you have all of these um, tabs that are at your disposal and each one of them have so many different commands and every single one of those has a menu that has many different more commands and it's kind of endless in some cases. So the first thing that I want to kind of communicate to you is that I use particular terminology because this can be quite confusing navigating through here. So the way that I usually will um, the way that I'll usually refer to these different things is that this first level of the menu, I'll call that the tabs. So I'll say the params tab, the math tab, set tab, so on and so forth. Okay, And then underneath of that, 
I'll call each one of these, you know, subsets, I'll call those panels. Okay, so under the set tab, the list panel, such and such node or command or whatever, you know, I'll, I sometimes call them nodes or commands, um, or I'll just call it by its name. Okay, so that one's kind of interchangeable sometimes. I like to change it up because you can't say node too many times. Anyway, um, so set tab, list panel, dispatch command, or dispatch node, or just dispatch. Okay, so that's how I'll communicate it in the videos, just for your future reference so you don't get confused. Okay, um, <clears throat> so let's talk very quickly about what each of these are and where you might begin to start looking for certain things. Um, for this, I'm going to pull it across so that I can see more of the program. So, params. I like to think of the params tab as almost like being your home for lots of different types of inputs, right? So, like, you're not going to find too many things that process information here under params. Okay, and it usually will take some sort of external information and then make it readable by Grasshopper and then plug it into something that's going to process it into a new geometry. Under math, um, the maths tab has a lot of relationship sort of nodes. So you'll find that eventually we're going to get to a point where we're doing, you know, greater than or less than um, and equal to things. We'll do some trigonometry in here. Um, but these are, they primarily do not create geometry, they just process the data that creates geometry, okay? Um, sets is kind of a pretty dynamic one. Um, you'll do a lot with sets here. Um, they actually will organize and kind of like pick through the data that we're working with and then feed it into commands that re rely upon either patterning or, or you know, setting up different sets of information and feeding them in in certain orders. Um, so that, that's primarily where you get a lot of that, um, a lot of those commands. Under vector, this is going to be your geometrical organization, right? Pretty, pretty self-explanatory. You get everything where you need to set base points or create certain types of organizational structure like grids and stuff, um, setting planes, um, creating points or setting points or reference points and all that kind of stuff. Uh, curve is pretty much for your basic, simple, two-dimensional geometry, right? So creating a circle versus creating a sphere where you would find in surface, okay? So surface has all of your solids, all of your planar geometry, and then there's meshes, right? So you're familiar with the relationship in Rhino of uh, NURBS surfaces to mesh surfaces. So meshes function off of uh, primarily lots of trigonometry, and NURBS will function off of interpolated curves and you know three-dimensional data points. Okay, so um, <coughs> intersect is sort of just kind of trying to find references of either two-dimensional or three-dimensional geometries to each other. So if you've ever done um, the section command in Rhino to get line work, that would be under intersect. Right, so just to, to try and you know get you to visualize that, transform is primarily a three-dimensional modifier, and then display is a lot about like well how am I visualizing this? How can I change the way it looks so that I can understand it better? Because right now I've got all this crap in there and everything's red, you know that kind of stuff. Um, I don't really is what WB is new. I haven't used WB, so this looks new to me. Oh, Weaverbird. Yeah, I haven't really used it. We might use it. Paneling tools is cool. It's it's a little bit like uh, it's a little bit like a mix of sets, vector, and intersect. Um, but I don't have a lot of experience with it. Only for very particular cases. So we might not use it too much. And then Kangaroo is like mega cool. So Kangaroo is essentially a physics engine. So you can actually create things that. Or modified over time so like you can create an elastic surface where when you pull it it actually pulls and kind of like flops into place where it finds its natural equilibrium and all that kind of stuff so that's how you do a lot of like your tent structures and stuff like that you can get it really well uh, modified here and uh, you know it's pretty it's pretty close to an actual you know an actual real physics engine so you'll get you'll get a lot of good like G forces out of it and stuff and then lunchbox is I understand, I, don't, I haven't used Lunchbox a ton, but I understand Lunchbox to be a way to um, program and modify and package groups of commands into very complex geometrical modifiers. 
So that'll essentially be where you can, you know, if you've created a, if you've created, you know, like 60 different nodes that process a square into, you know, some kind of like facade component or something like that, you can wrap all of them up into one command and do it with lunchbox and then it, you just drop it in, you have all your inputs and then it creates the output, something like that. Um, you know, obviously you can do a bunch of things with the geometry there that are far more complex than what you would do with simple geometries in a very simplified way. So creating like a brace grid 2D structure, if you were to do that manually in Grasshopper, you need to do a whole bunch of different steps in order to get there. This makes it very simple in a way of just doing it with one. Okay? So that's kind of your roadmap to all the different types of commands that are available to you. Um, but let's start to look at how do we actually put something in model space. So to start off, I'm actually just going to kind of maximize my top view. Um, I'll switch over to, actually, let's just do it in perspective. All right, you can see top view in perspective, just from a perspective view. <coughs> um, so let's kind of get started with a couple of things that will um, that we're going to use kind of as the backbone of this class to get started, right? So you saw in the assignment, um, whoops, you saw in the oh, go away. All right, so you saw in the assignment that we're working off of a couple different things here. Those three elements are sort of the building blocks of built space: point, line, and plane. Okay, you'll see lots of references to point, line, and plane in your academic studies as you continue on, you know, learning about architecture and design and graphic development and all that other stuff. Um, so we're starting with that as a uh, launch pad for us to understand the digital world, right? Because everything in the digital world is going to be built off of point, line, and plane, right? That's essentially our most basic geometry. <coughs> So um, I, when, I went, when I went through the, the sphere with you in the last video, I basically gave you everything you need to know to create any simple geometry. I mean, you pretty much can do any of that right now. So if you look at surfaces um, under primitive, which is where you're going to find a lot of the really, really basic ones, um, the hint here is, you know, if you have never used a command before, you don't really have to Google much, right? Because if I want to make a cone and I drop it in, right, you already know that it's got pre-programmed values, but if you hover over, it's going to tell you what kind of values it's looking for. So a lot of your own investigative work will get you there. So it's going to ask for a base plane, which it already assumes is the origin in my model space. It's going to ask for a radius at the cone base, and then it's going to ask for the L value, which is the cone height, right? So radius and length. Those are the only two variables that it's going to ask for. So at this point, I'm going to leave it at the origin. So you don't have to override that with a point. I just did to show you how it works. I'm just going to leave it there at the origin. And I'm going to create a base that says 0 less than 10, less than 10. And I'll plug that in. Okay, And you see that it, it increased the, the width of the base there. Um, to copy. It functions like any other program. You could either right click and copy and right click and paste, or you can do a control C and a control V, and then pull it down below and plug that into the next value. And then as you rotate down and look at it in perspective, there's your cone. Fully modifiable. I can pull this down, or I can pull it up, or I can decrease the radius and make it more narrow and sharp. Okay, so um, let me pause this video here, and then I just want to see that you guys had, and it doesn't matter which geometry you pick, I just want to see that you picked one and that you put in a couple of the required inputs. I would say stick to either the cylinder, the cone, the sphere, um, maybe the box. You probably can get away with the box. First corner, second corner. Nah, don't do the box. Sphere, cone, um, or cylinder for now. Or you can do box rectangle. You should be able to do that one. So, you know, I'm, I'm still focusing on, I just showed you how to create a geometry, but I'm really focusing on user interface and how do you use the software. So um, I want to kind of show you a few things here as well with like, 
after you've put something in the workspace, how do you modify it? What are the ways that you can modify certain things? Um, <clears throat> I'll get into, you know, well, let's start with the number slider, right? Because the number slider we're going to use a lot. And um, it's sort of indicative of the type of modification that you can do on a lot of different inputs. So um, double clicking on a node like the number slider will open up properties, right? So if I double click on this, actually, so there's kind of two different ways you could double click on this. You could double click on the number and change the number value. So if I want to just switch directly from three to 10 and check, it'll immediately jump to that rather than sliding. So that's really useful, actually, really useful when you have very, very complex, um, you know, definitions that have a lot of different geometry. Sometimes, like, I've done, I've done point maps on this where I'm creating a developable surface off of, like, a, you know, a 3D, you know, cloud of points for an actual landscape. Um, and I've had one and a half million points that it was trying to process. So to have it slide from one to two to three to four to five to six and process one and a half million points, each step is really slow. So it's actually more prudent for you to just jump directly to the next number. So that's really important. Um, the length, um, or rather uh, the other uh, uh, way that you can click is to double click on the name or just right click and go to properties. But if you double click on the name, there's a couple of things that you should be aware of and while while um, not all of the properties for each command or node are going to look exactly like this, you will be able to do a lot of things similarly. You can always change the value. You can always change uh, the name of it to display in some other way. Um, and you should always be able to change, you know, kind of like the accuracy. If it's a numerical value, you can change the accuracy. Or if it's um, sort of a toggleable value, you should be able to, in most cases, change what that uh, toggle value kind of is, right? So like if you're dealing with Boolean functions, you can change it from zero to one or false to true or something like that. Um, but for here for um, the number slider, right? I plugged in a number slider. So if I go back to params and I click there, right here it actually says slider. And then it gives me a number. And when I dropped it in, it has 0 0.250. And then if I plug that in, it switches to radius. OK, so it's going to try and automate a few things for you. And when you're dealing with really simple definitions, that's actually kind of nice. But once you get into you know, really complex forms that are kind of building off of one another, you're going to want to know, well, is this you know, the radius of the cone? Is it the radius of my plan overall? Is it the radius of my minimum maximum value? You know, what radius is this? So if that's the case, you can uh, double click and change the name. So if I change the name, I'm going to call this radius cone or just R cone. You know, you probably don't want to keep everything too descriptive because then it just gets really long and long winded and yeah. So if I change it to R cone, that new uh, title gets placed in the actual node right there. Okay. So similarly, um, in my properties, there are a couple of different ways that it can read a number. And um, you know, right now, when I just dropped in the number slider, it actually defaults to 0 to 1. And it defaults to a precision of three decimal places. Okay, so that can be changed. Right here you have uh, the slider accuracy and you can either round the number or you can change the digits which is essentially how many, you know, how many decimal points do you want it to read to. So if I've got it on two, it'll read to the hundredth. Okay, and then here under rounding, it'll ask you for either integers or point numbers which is a real number um, or evens or odds, right? So those are your options for, you know, how you can format that number slider. Um, and then here, when you have these um, minimum, maximum, and the range value, I can just change the range value to 100, and it changes my minimum, maximum from 0 to 100. Or I can just manually change either the 0 or the 100 for the minimum or maximum. Okay, so I'm, I'm explaining 
everything to you so that you then can apply it to other inputs, right? So while the rest of them may not necessarily have, you know, real numbers or integers or anything like that, you can pretty much modify the way that the information is being processed, okay? And by the end of tonight, I think you'll really get a, a solid understanding of what that means, okay? And then you can also manually change the numerical value right here too if you want to. So that just made it really huge. Okay. All right. Um, so notice that when I did my number slider and I said 0 less than 10, less than 10, I can only change it to real numbers. Or, sorry, integers. Um, so what I need to do if I want to have decimal pl places when I'm doing a shortcut, I say 0 less than, and wherever I start, I just add two decimal places. So I'll say like 5.55. Okay, so now I can go two decimal places from 0 to 5.55. Okay? <clears throat> All right, so um, display settings. So while we're still kind of on the subject of user interface, I want to talk to you about that icon in the center of this node. Those can change to descriptive text if you want it to. Um, under display, you can toggle the draw icons setting up here so you can turn off draw icons and it'll display and you might see this. A lot of people actually prefer the text, the descriptive text. When you get online and you start looking things up, um, you'll find that most people will work with the descriptive text and so you should be familiar with reading either the icon or the text. So that is also modifiable. It is called cone. The command is called cone. But if I, if I right click it, I can change that and I can call it cone A. And that text changes to cone A. Okay, so this is how you start to kind of visually understand the differences between the different things that you've um, programmed. Okay, so um, yeah. Um, also, yeah, that one. Okay. So here's the other one. So um, if you right click on it and right next to the actual name that you've set up, you can change it to either read text alone, the icon itself, or, um, or the text kind of like block thing. So um, while the text here, I forget which one it was important for. It was the parameters input. All right, so while the text here, if I have these two settings under TXT for always draw name or the icon or the application setting showing that, um, it's very, very important here under, say, the integer input. So this integer input is what I would call a um, static, static, uh, meaning it doesn't change, static node. So um, right now it says INT but that's just showing up as text versus up here where it had an icon that says seven, which is really, really confusing, okay? Because the integer, when I right click on it and I go to set integer, I make that a five and I hit okay and it still says INT. Or if I'm seeing it as an icon, it says seven, which is really, really confusing. So when you right click it, I suggest for this sort of confusing odd situation, changing it to text and changing the value itself to, whoops, I made it seven. That was confusing. Changing it to the value itself, which is five. Okay, so this particular video got really, really long, but I like to try and keep, you know, user interface stuff kind of all, you know, compartmentalized. So that's primarily the basic display settings that you should be aware of. Okay, are there any questions? No? Okay. So I'll stop this video. I'll give you guys a chance to kind of take a breath here. Um, take a five-minute break, and then we'll continue on, you know, with some more stuff.